I say this most often about, you know, conversations in romantic relationships, but this applies here too. Important conversations don't have to just be one shot. You don't have to be perfect or address this perfectly. You don't have to figure out the exact best way to say things and plan out the entire interaction beforehand. Hey everybody, before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self Help Podcast, episode 291. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people just like you. And today I have a question and answer episode. Um, before I get into the questions and answers, I wanted to uh, bring up just a, a little strategy that might be helpful to you guys right now. So, at the time that I'm recording this, um, it is the day after, I suppose. Um, uh, it's kind of confusing how the time works on that. But yeah, the day after Russia invaded uh, the Ukraine, and I don't know where this is going to go. You know, I don't know what exactly is going to happen from here. It's obviously unfolding sort of as I record this. And um, it's really an interesting experience these days being in the just day and age that we're in with so much access to information, you know, from social media to websites like Reddit to, you know, live news feeds that you can find online. There are instant responses to things. There are, you know, instant videos and audio clips of what's going on in the world. And uh, it's really, really easy to get glued to that and to get really, really um, anxious about that. And, you know, it, it's worthy of being anxious of. This is not, you know, a light thing that's happening. This is something that is going to have global consequences. There are lives that are being lost. There is uh, destruction going on. There are implications, you know, for you know, wherever you live. Um, and so it's, it's a big thing and it's something that is, uh, definitely important to keep up with. I think it's part of, you know, one's responsibility to understand what's going on and keep up with it, but being glued to the news, um, isn't always helpful. I said this before on the podcast. Um, I think probably around the time that there was, uh, maybe it was when there were fires going on. I don't know. I, I did an episode a while back about just sort of how to, handle emergency situations. And, um, you know, one piece of advice that I often give is just the acknowledgement that your awareness of the news has no bearing on the fact that it's playing out, that it's happening, right? So whether or not you are constantly updated about it, that doesn't change anything. Unless it's happening to you, like in your city, at a place that you need to take action, um, being constantly glued to the news isn't going to help you in that case. And so one strategy that I've used and I was using last night, which is, which is very helpful for me, is to take breaks, to set a timer. So at first, when everything started going down, I had you know live feeds pulled up and I was just kind of getting the lay of the land and understanding what the hell is going on out there. And then after a while, I kind of came to the end of the new information, um, you know, at, at least to some extent. And at that point, what I did is I set a one hour timer. I'm like, okay, I have stuff that I, that I have to get done. You know, my life doesn't necessarily stop, even though some people's lives are stopping out there, unfortunately. And, um, you know, I'm going to be expected to go to work and help people tomorrow. And I have to continue, you know, the patient care report writing, all these different things that I'm doing. So, you know, I can't be just off duty for the whole night. So I set a one hour timer. And, you know, it takes a few minutes to kind of switch gears and get into work mode. But, you know, I put on some relaxing music, you know, whatever is a good sort of uh, mind filler while I'm working, was able to get some work done. And then an hour comes around and I go back and check in. And um, I posted all this on Instagram last night as well. So some of you probably already saw this, but, you know, after an hour, I pull up things and I'm like, okay, we're basically in the same spot, not too much new information, you know, some new conjecture, some 
guesses about things and, you know, all that sort of stuff, but not too much new information. Okay. So set another hour timer, <laughs> you know, keep working, do whatever I need to do and then check in again. And I, I think it's just a strategy that a lot of people could employ to not feel guilty about avoiding the news or, um, you know, th there's a sense of guilt that comes sometimes uh, again in this day and age, you know, with not being constantly on the pulse of everything at every single moment. And I don't think that you need to feel guilty for that, but I do think it's important to be informed. So that's a strategy that maybe might help some people. And of course, you know, there's, there's very likely, um, it, or it's very likely the case that if something were to be huge, massive, catastrophic, something that you need to react to, even if you're in another country, you would probably find out about it in another way, right? You'd probably get an alert on your phone. Someone would call you, someone would walk in the room and be like, dude, did you see this? You know, so if it's that huge, there's a good chance you're going to find out about it, even if you're in the middle of one of those breaks. Um, and then even if you don't, you know, think about it, you know, a few minutes to an hour, whatever, what difference is that going to make in most cases? So just something to think about. Um, everybody has the right to do what they would like in terms of their info consumption and, and how they approach the news and uh, where they get their information from and such. But um, I know that a lot of you guys out there in the particular population that listens to my show uh, might have a bit of a hard time with this sort of thing. So I hope that helps. So that said, um, let's go ahead and get into the questions. Um, if you guys want to send me a question, uh, send it to duffthepsych at gmail.com. Uh, please do not send it to me on social media. If you do, I'm just going to tell you to send me an email anyway. Um, and yeah, I've been getting some good questions, but as always, I, I constantly need more. So please do send them in, even if you're not sure if it's going to be a good question. Uh, the questions in this episode are, you know, honestly a little bit heavier. Um, there's one question that is about, um, uh, suicide, not talking about somebody's suicide with detail necessarily, but just the topic of it. And, uh, also, um, with like young student populations, and the second one has to do with uh, some trauma. Again, not nothing graphically described, but just talking about physical violence and the effects of that. So just be aware of that. Um, I, I, there, there are some good tips that I'm going to share here and some things that I think are really good food for thought. But uh, if you're not in a place to hear such heavy stuff, I don't blame you. It's all good. But important questions, so I want to make sure I get to them. So let's go ahead and get into the first one. All right, so here's the first question, and apologies if um, I'm a little stuffy today, um, if I have any odd sounds or I uh, sniffle or anything like that. The wind has been uh, pretty intense over here, and it's been making my allergies and sinuses kind of fucked up, so it is what it is. The show must go on. <laughs> um, but here's the question. It reads, hey, Dr. Duff, uh, my son is in the fifth grade and attends a K-12 through school. And for anybody who's uh, not from the U.S., that's, you know, uh, kindergarten, so um, below grade school, um, all the way through the end of high school. So that's a big swath. And a lot of times um, you don't have K through 12 schools. You might have like K through fifth or sixth. And then that breaks out into, uh, say, middle school or junior high, which is like sixth, seventh, and eighth or seventh and eighth. And then high school would be nine, 10, 11, 12. Um, so this is a, a school that has a lot of different kids in it, a big range of ages there. Um, recently, an eighth grade student committed suicide. I'm sad to report this is the second in less than a year. Of course, my husband and I are discussing switching schools, but there's no running away from these things. I talked with my son about reporting bullying and reaching out to talk to someone about his feelings. What advice do you have to talk to children about such tragedy? Um, so yeah, really great question. And uh, unfortunately, one that, you know, we do need to consider. I, I think there are multiple layers to consider here as well. But I want to say I appreciate that you're thinking about this, that you're being proactive about these discussions, which can be really difficult, you know, difficult to have with a kid or with an adult, even amongst yourselves. It, it's a hard topic for a lot of people to talk about and to know what to do about it. Um, and it's really tragic to hear that there have been multiple students at this school that have died by suicide. Um, I wish it was more rare, rarer, I wish it was rarer, but unfortunately, um, suicide is a leading cause of death in school-aged people. And for the purposes of this question, I'm going to be loose with my terminology about suicide, you know, death by suicide, suicide. I'm going to use different terms just so I don't get hung up in it. Um, I know that uh, depending on the person, you might have a particular preference in terms of how that's stated, um, but I'm going to just do the best that I can with that, okay? So first, I want to ground you a little bit in sort of how to think about the situation at your kid's school, and then we can talk a bit about the approach for addressing it with him. Um, so according to the CDC, um, the Center for Disease Control, Centers for Disease Control, 
uh, the national suicide rate of U.S. people aged 10 to 24, so 10 to 24 year olds, was 10.7 per 100,000 people, and that was in 2018. I'm not sure if there's a more recent statistic. That's the one that I could find. Um, but they've been relatively similar. They've come up a bit in the past few years. And so, um, you know, the, this could be different now. But 10.7 per 100,000 people is the rate of suicide for people 10 to 24. Um, now, what you can do is you can kind of consider the size of, of your school or the size of the schools in your region, whatever kind of uh, group you want to put them in, and then consider how this statistic applies. So um, that's that's one thing that you can do here. And the other thing to think about is things might be a little bit different even than that with the issue of the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Things have changed a bit probably, and it will take some time for the statistics uh, about, you know, even 2021 to shake out and see really where things land. Um, but obviously there are issues that you can probably imagine, such as social isolation, um, issues caused at home because of the stress of it, changes in work, you know, loss of jobs, all these sorts of things that, that could be potential contributors. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. Okay, this episode is brought to you by EveryPlate. EveryPlate is an awesome uh, meal kit that delivers pre-portioned ingredients and easy to follow recipe cards right to your door so you can spend less time prepping and cooking and more time enjoying good food. Now, the special thing about EveryPlate is that they are a much lower price than many other meal kits. A lot of them come with a premium price tag, and instead, every plate offers tasty dinners that try not to break the bank. But they don't skip on the portion sizes or the quality of the ingredients. Um, you can choose between 17 different recipes that change each week. And if you want to, you can make it flexible. You can swap out your proteins, your veggies, and your sides to your liking. So there are a lot of options there. And those are even reflected in the card. So if you wanted to swap out a protein, they give you other information about you know, what you would do with that other protein if you were doing that. Um, the cards are very easy to understand. I think they're, you know, um, even for the novice chef, very easy to follow along with and make some really good food. I made uh, a few different recipes from the box that they sent me. I made garlic rosemary chicken, which was really delicious. Um, it gave me uh, a little bit of exposure to making a pan sauce, which is cool. That's a kind of a skill that I've been working with and one that um, I will continue to do so after, you know, this experience. And uh, also there was uh, roasted root vegetables with it. So some sweet potatoes, carrots, uh, regular potatoes, really good stuff. Um, the family liked it. I made it on a night that uh, my wife was gone and not cooking. I try to make dinner, you know, maybe once or twice a week. And for me, one of the things that meal kits are really great for, especially every plate, is just the fact that everything's there for you. Uh, where I get hung up on with cooking is sometimes the preparation, <laughs> taking the meat out, you know, getting everything ready, making sure I have the right ingredients. Don't have to worry about that with every plate. And one of the great things is that everything is all prepackaged and ready to go. So if you end up not using everything in a recipe, you can use it in something else. So uh, yeah, I made that uh, garlic rosemary chicken. It was delicious. I also made some uh, stuffed meatloaf with uh, onions and peppers, which was also delicious. Uh, both of those, the, uh, the my boys, my uh, four and six-year-old gave it their seal of approval. So you know it's decent. So we got a good deal for you here. You can try every plate for just $1.79 per meal, $1.79 per meal by going to everyplate.com and enter the code DUFF179. So you can get started with every plate for just $1.79 per meal by going to everyplate.com, enter the code DUFF179. All right, back to the show. It's really weird the way the statistics work out. You know, like if you take something with less than a 1% likelihood, um, that might seem super, super rare, right? But then you apply that statistic even to just like, say, a stadium full of people, like for the Super Bowl or a concert or something, you start going, wow, like this many people are probably going to die from this particular disease. This many people are likely to get in a car accident. Uh, this many people are going to get struck by lightning. And, you know, when you take a, a very small statistic and you multiply it by a large body of people, um, there's, there's relative certainty that, you know, you're going to see some examples of whatever it is that you're thinking of. Um, now, statistics are not always clean. You know, this is a national average, and it's not, per, you know, considering particular factors for a single school or anything like that. Um, but there are factors uh, like within a given school or a given region, um, a point in time, these could all impact the likelihood of suicide. Like I said, the, the pandemic, for instance. Um, so this is something to think about, you know, in terms of how you wrap your head around the fact that two kids in this school have uh, died by suicide within the past year. Um, is that a, you know, very, very 
uh, unlikely scenario, or is it a really huge school? And this is something that unfortunately is statistically probable. And I, I kind of am almost uh, hesitant to even bring up statistics because we're talking about human lives here. You know, like one kid dying by suicide is too many. But you're talking about decisions like switching schools and, you know, just sort of what to do about this. And so I think it's important to at least, um, you know, f understand how that figures into things. Um, another thing I want to talk about is uh, maybe you've heard the term before, uh, suicide contagion. I, I kind of hate the term. <laughs> I kind of hate the term. Uh, it's sort of a buzzword. Um, and it, it's, it's a thing that there is some interesting research on. But the thing is, the research is a bit hard to interpret. So I would definitely not take, say, an article by NPR or Vogue or, you know, I don't know, Wall Street Journal or something like that at face value, because the person writing that may not really be equipped to interpret the data that are, that are out there and the research articles that are out there. Um, but basically, uh, suicide contagion is the term for the notion that people who are exposed to suicide in their social social sphere or, you know, in their workplace, um, even sometimes by media coverage, especially when that coverage is specific and graphic in its descriptions. Um, so it's a notion that people who are exposed in that way have themselves a higher likelihood of attempting suicide or making, you know, suicidal behaviors. And uh, the research, you know, it generally indicates that there is some sort of impact, but it's hard to interpret, as I said. Uh, it's not necessarily causal, meaning cause and effect, right? There's a really common term in statistics that, you know, correlation is not causation. And that basically means two things that tend to go together don't necessarily mean that one caused the other, right? So the classic example is like, um, you know, there might be a, a raise in crime rates when the uh, ice cream sales go up, <laughs> right? And it may not have anything to do with the ice cream sales. It may have to do with the fact that it's really hot out, which makes people irritable. And so people are more likely to snap, right? So Correlation is not necessarily causation, and a lot of these studies are kind of correlational in in nature. They do some fancy statistics to try to to try to you know glean what they can from it, um, but you can't exactly do like a randomized controlled trial of this. So um, you have to think about what are some other reasons that maybe both contributed to the suicides happening and also influenced the um, you know suicide behaviors in subsequent instances, you know, within the same area, other people who were, you know, quote, impacted by the contagion of it. Maybe there's a, a third thing out there that's affecting both of those. Let's say that, you know, the pandemic is a really big factor in this. That's something that would affect both the person who died by suicide and the people who subsequently, you know, died by suicide. Maybe it didn't have anything to do with the suicide itself. Maybe it had to do with this other outside factor. It, I hope that makes sense. Um, I know it can be a little bit complicated, but that's that's one way to think about this. Um, now one of the pieces of research that does, uh, lend some credence to the idea that there's some sort of real suicide contagion and it's not just, you know, all coincidences is that, uh, people are impacted differently. It seems depending on their closeness to the person that died. Now this might seem a little obvious, but, uh, you know, you have to look at these things through research. And so one meta analysis, which is uh, basically a research study that looks at other research studies and pulls them together and sees the trends within them. Um, but one meta-analysis that looked into this showed that people who were uh, family members, so direct kin of the person that died, have the largest increase in suicidal thoughts or behaviors, followed by friends of the person, so like, you know, close social contacts. And then there was actually no statistically notable increase in the likelihood of, of suicidal behaviors or thoughts among people that were just more distant peers of the person that died, right? So this would be somebody maybe in the school that didn't know the person very well. So the largest increase would be family, followed by direct friends, and then peers would possibly have, you know, not too much of a difference there. So, you know, all of this said, how does that apply to you? Um, in your question, you said the, the, the phrase, of course, my husband and I are discussing switching schools, but there's no running away from these things. So I think there's a lot of things to consider about switching schools. Um, I'm not going to tell you what to do here. Definitely, this is, a, this is a family decision. It's something that you guys get to decide and should decide. But, um, you know, one thing to think about is, is there an identifiable issue in the school or in the region that you live that's contributing to these issues? So a school may be having a lack of staff or no school counselor available, um, a school being just highly competitive. We've seen that before in the past. Schools that are sort of ruthlessly competitive can definitely cause 
issues um, and anything like this uh, that's that's consistent that's there that affects everybody can contribute to a higher risk of mental health issues and suicidal behaviors and it's important to note that for this um, particular age range suicide isn't only influenced by things like depression and bullying and sort of the the hard difficult sad stuff trauma and such but um, impulsivity can also be a big factor so adolescents have kind of squishy frontal lobes the part of their brain that would normally inhibit behavior that's that's odd um, or not odd but like impulsive you know that doesn't work as well um, in my in my workbook for anxiety that I'm writing right now I give the example of uh, a friend of mine I call him like Josh or something in the book but really his name was Chris <laughs> and he like uh, I was at a movie with him as teenagers and he got like the giant cup of soda filled with ice and just threw it in the middle of the theater like just threw it into the crowd and like yelled something like grenade out or something like that and like what the hell are you doing chris and the answer is you didn't really think about it because he had a squishy frontal lobe and he was just a dumb idiot child <laughs> and uh not to be too harsh about it but that's kind of how it is um adolescents don't have the capability to think as rationally as quickly you know they're capable of making good decisions absolutely but the automatic process of inhibiting behavior when it's appropriate isn't always um, right there at the forefront. So, um, you know, if you know some of the things about the people that died in, this, in, in your specific case, that can help to fill in the gaps, right? So you maybe know some of the factors that are going on. Maybe there's a bullying problem at your school, as you mentioned, or some of the other things that I've already brought up, and that would help you to, to already know some of the factors there. But it's important to not make too many assumptions if you don't. And then there are also risks to changing schools, right? You know, one protective factor for suicide is having a social network that's supportive and caring and is there to sort of catch you when you're having a hard time. And stability also helps. So suddenly switching schools in response to something like this could potentially have its own risks. So there's just a lot of lot to think about, and I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all approach that you can apply here. Um, there's just some considering to do. I think whenever possible, um, it's helpful to involve your child, right? To involve your kid in the decision making. So you don't have to give them the false impression that like their, their opinion is the end all be all, that they get to decide exactly what they're going to do here. Because ultimately, you're the parents, you're going to make that decision. But talking with your kid about this and what they would like to do could potentially make that decision making process a lot easier for you. Right, so maybe you say, "Hey, what do you want to do about this?" Um, we we were considering whether it would make sense to change schools or what. And if you're you you know you yourself are really having a hard time with that decision, but they're like, "Yes, please get me out of here. I hate it here. I would love to go to another school." Then maybe you're like, "Okay, sweet, let's do it. Done and done." Right, but if that's not the case, if they're really really insistent that they would like to stay, you know, they don't want to leave their friends, you know, at least maybe not before the sixth grade or something like that, then that might give you a little bit more pause and more to talk about and consider. As I said at the beginning of this response, um, I'm glad that you're talking to your kid about this. I'm glad that you're being proactive. One thing that I often encourage parents of children to do when it comes to big topics like this is to lead with curiosity. So to, you know, not assume what they know, but ask them, ask them what they've heard about what happened, right? So, hey, Johnny, um, obviously there's been a lot going on at your school what do you know about it? What have you been told about it? What are the teachers talking about? What have your friends told you? Right? So let them tell you, you know, be open-ended. Don't just be like, do you know this? Yes or no. Do you know this? Yes or no. But let them um, come forth with whatever information they, they can, if they're willing to, you know, ask them how they feel about it. Ask them if they have any questions for you. Um, you know, stressing that no question about this is going to get them in trouble. They're not going to share information that's going to get them, you know, get you mad at them or something like that. But, you know, ask them if they have any questions, if there's anything that they are concerned about. And you can ask them point blank if this is something that they've ever considered, right? Have you ever thought of hurting yourself or just disappearing? You know, why or why not? That can be scary to ask, but, you know, it's important to know. It's important to know you can't avoid these things just because you are scared of them as the parent. Now, they're a kid, right? So you're not going to get a full grown adult conversation out of all of these. But you could get some really helpful information, and you're also showing them the respect that they deserve and openness through this act. So this should hopefully kind of set the stage for further conversations and for them to feel okay being open with you about stuff. It can also guide you in terms of what else you might need to do to intervene or to educate them. Um, they may know a lot more than you think, or they might be very, very naive about it all. 
And both of those are okay, but they're starting points. They help you understand where they're at. Um, and your kid might get annoyed at you. They might be like, oh, God, Mom, I don't want to talk about this. We talked about this a million times at school and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, that's your prerogative. You're allowed to ask about it. You're allowed to ask multiple times. You're allowed to continue to check in. Um, I think that uh, you're allowed to take their word into account for sure. But um, it's it's something that's worth at least checking in and talking about. Um, and you can ask them to have regular conversations, too, about how things are going at school, you know, how they're feeling in their heart, you know, if there's anything that they need. And ideally, you want to build a relationship of trust if you can, such that you can kind of take them at their word. You know that they're going to be honest with you. You know, if they say that they're not being bullied um, and the evidence kind of supports that, you don't see them, you know, exhibiting behaviors or signs of being bullied. They seem generally happy. You know, if all these things sort of add up, then maybe you don't have to continue probing so often anymore. Um, if they can know that you or somebody else is a trusted resource, they have a place they can come to in times of hardship, then absolutely they can, you know, go about their way and use that when needed. And that goes a long way in helping them feel not hopeless and not alone if something were to come up. I say this most often about, you know, conversations in romantic relationships, but this applies here too. Important conversations don't have to just be one shot. You don't have to be perfect or address this perfectly. You don't have to figure out the exact best way to say things and plan out the entire interaction beforehand. You just need to start. You broach the topic, you bring it up, you lead with your heart, and then you just come back to it again in the future if needed. If something doesn't land right or it goes off the rails, you get, get in an argument, whatever, that's okay. You just continue clarifying later. It's just a starting point. It doesn't have to be the end all be all. And you don't have to get more graphic than you need to. But at the same time, I also wouldn't shy away from the fact that somebody took their life and they will not be coming back. And you're concerned because you love your kid and you just want to make sure that they understand there are many other options if they've ever felt similarly or if they ever do feel similarly. So, you know, you don't have to go into the excruciating detail of it unless they have those questions and you're comfortable and you have that kind of relationship. But as I said, don't shy away from the facts of it. And this is one reason why I say that leading with curiosity can be helpful. You know, they may have much more awareness than you think because information is a whole lot more available now than it used to be, right? So when you were growing up, this sort of thing was a lot less talked about, a lot less, uh, you know, publicly understood. That's different now. So you might be surprised. So overall, um, I think that if you are concerned and talking with your kid in a way that demonstrates that you care for them, you're already doing a huge part of what will help. So take your time with these decisions, you know, revisit the conversations, check in with your advisors or other parents, your therapist, whoever you might have in your corner, keep checking in with the kid, keep caring, and I think you'll be all right. So thank you for the question. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. Okay, this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Uh, relationships take work. <laughs> you should know that if you've listened to the show, I cover a lot of relationship questions. But the most important relationship you can have in your life is the relationship with yourself. A lot of us will drop anything. We will literally set ourselves on fire to keep someone else warm. But we don't always give ourselves the same treatment. So, you know, for me, I think that uh, I, I do a few things to really make sure I am doing that because I have a lot of time spent taking care of other people. So to me, things like taking breaks, alone time, you know, meditation, listening to music that I like, playing games that I like. All of these are ways for me to invest in myself, and occasionally that also involves therapy. So this month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you that you matter just as much as everybody else does, and therapy is a great way to make sure that you show up for yourself. BetterHelp is a online therapy platform that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. You don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to, but you absolutely can. It tends to be more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours, which is very quick compared to, you know, in-person therapy. Give it a try. See why over 2 million people are using BetterHelp Online Therapy. Since this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash duff. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash duff. All right, back to the show. All right, so on to question two. It reads, I'm trying to work through some struggles from my childhood, and I have some questions related to that. First, a little backstory. I'm 25 years old. Growing up, my father was an alcoholic. He still is. When I was 14, he had a violent episode. I've tried to recall what happened, but it's like my brain is locked. 
But even if my brain cannot remember, my body still remembers. I get panic attacks and I struggle with an eating disorder. Both started to happen after this thing with my father. Firstly, I find it difficult to talk about since I have almost no memory of the episode. Furthermore, after the episode, my father ignored me for a good couple of years. He wouldn't look, me, look me in the eye, etc. That made me almost believe that I was making it up in my mind. Last year, I talked with my little sister about that night for the first time, as she had also been present. I don't know why I never thought about talking to her about it sooner, but I finally got confirmed what I always thought had happened, but never actually knew. So turning to my issue in question, when I'm in therapy, I try to notice what I feel and I either get so numb that the feeling disappears, or I get nightmare-looking scenes that come flashing in front of my eyes, which scares me so much that I just shut off. After almost a year of therapy, I'm starting to get slightly frustrated. I feel I'm just banging my head against a brick wall, the brick wall being me and how my body responds, and I can't seem to move past it. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on the subject. Okay, so thank you for writing in and for trusting me with this information. Um, I'm sorry that happened to you. You know, even if you don't have a clear memory of exactly what happened, you see the impact that it's had, which has really been troubling for you. So I'm glad you survived, and I wish you didn't have to have experienced that. You didn't deserve it, and you also don't deserve what you're feeling right now. Uh, what you bring up is a really interesting situation. Uh, a lot of people who have gone through trauma uh, don't feel that they totally remember it. And there are a variety of reasons for this, potentially. Um, it's understood that repression, so, you know, basically... Uh, I don't know how to say it without saying repressed, uh, pushing memories away from your conscious awareness can be a defense mechanism to protect our minds from the pain of trauma. And there are other factors as well, like the fact that uh, abusers often minimize or deny what happened, as you've experienced. So when there aren't witnesses or other corroborating information, you can really start to doubt yourself. Uh, trauma can be a lightning rod for gaslighting where you start to feel like you're the crazy one, that you did something to bring it about, that uh, it actually didn't happen, things of that sort. So in your situation, it's a little bit different, right? Um, I'm super proud of you for talking to your sister about this. I think that takes a shit ton of courage to do, and you should be really proud of yourself. Again, a lot of people won't speak up about this because uh, the abuse that happened, they feel like maybe they made it up. They're worried that they're exaggerating or making it up entirely. And they don't want to cause drama or get somebody else in trouble when they might be wrong. So you had to overcome your own personal doubts about this, your hangups about it, and speak up to your sister. And what did you get from that? Confirmation. Like, holy crap, you got confirmation. She confirmed that what happened to you was true. That's amazing and that's powerful. You know, it's obviously not amazing what happened to you, but that validation is, is really powerful. Now, I do need to say that not everybody gets that. Not everybody gets that confirmation, and that doesn't make their trauma any less valid. We don't get to control trauma, right? Trauma happens to us um, regardless of the event itself. You see, as you said, how the body responds, what happens, and yeah, sometimes we don't get to know the full story of it, but we know the impact that it's had on us. In your case, though, you do have some validation, and that's powerful. I love what you said about that, about the fact that the body remembers even when your mind doesn't fully. That's absolutely how trauma works. Um, it sounds like one of the things you're experiencing when you're in therapy is what's called dissociation. This is basically the feeling of being detached from reality. You know, you might feel disconnected from your own body, or you might feel disconnected from the scene happening around you. There's a variety of ways this can happen. Some people feel like they're sort of watching things play out from a third-person perspective, feeling very numb, as you talked about. Um, and this is also understood to be a defense mechanism. It can be more or less a conscious process. Some people can intentionally sort of switch into dissociation, or at least they feel the pull toward it, and they have to try to fight it off or kind of give over to it. And for other people, it's not. You have no control over it. And the mind essentially just checks out because it doesn't want to feel the brunt of the pain that it's confronted with. And I, like I said, I think that's probably what's going on in therapy for you. You know, as you approach this topic that your mind tries to keep separate, it wants desperately to avoid, uh, you approach it and suddenly you're hit with these waves of numbness and dissociation. The other thing that you mentioned sounds a lot like flashbacks, you know, these nightmare looking scenes flashing in front of your eyes. Um, flashbacks are something that is common in trauma responses. Basically with trauma, we have this highly charged sensory memory or sensory memories, multiple ones sometimes that feel scarier and more immediate and more real than our other memories. So this creates a tendency to avoid them. 
you know, whether it's avoiding the specific memory and talking about it, or just avoiding the symptoms and feelings associated with that memory. Um, your mind wants to keep the memory in its special little box and put it away in your psyche in a place that's not accessible and just try not to approach it. And that helps it remain a threat, right? It helps it remain a threat because then you're not processing it. It gets to stay scary. In a previous episode, I called it basically the restricted section of your mind's library. And I, I really think that's a great metaphor for it. Um, it's something that can actively impact you, even if it happened years ago. So the process of unpacking this and progressively learning to approach these difficult things rather than avoid them in that way can take some time. You know, you said it's been almost a year. Um, I know that's a long time. <laughs> I know it's a long time, but think about how long you've lived with this issue. Think about the impact that this trauma has had in your life. It's been absolutely significant. So you may not be able to expect it to be resolved in, you know, a few weeks or even a few months, years. Um, hopefully it doesn't take years and years and years, right? But it can take some time. So that said, I, I'd ask a few questions here. Um, are you working with somebody that specializes in trauma? Trauma in general is something that uh, most therapists understand, but not as many people are super specialized in. There are multiple approaches to dealing with PTSD and other trauma reactions. Um, there's trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. There's EMDR. There's brain spotting. There are other approaches as well. But regardless of the approach, ideally you want to find somebody that has a good amount of experience with trauma. If you find somebody that specifically specializes in trauma, like that's their bread and butter, that's what they do, that would even be best. And I think this information can usually be gleaned from the provider's website or from contacting them directly. You know, if you catch them on, say, Psychology Today or whatever uh, app or, you know, uh, search engine you're using to look for a therapist, you can probably message them. You can probably give them uh, an email or a message and you can just ask like, hey, um, do you work with trauma? Can you tell me a bit about your approach for dealing with trauma? Um, is this a specialty of yours, et cetera? If you feel like you're stagnant with your therapist or that they're not using an approach that's helpful to you, I would encourage you to bring that up with them or consider looking at other options. Either one's fine. You know, you can start by saying, I feel like we're not getting anywhere. I'm feeling a little frustrated by this. And I was wondering what we can do here. Is there anything else that we could be doing? And if that doesn't help, then you can look at other options. Um, one other thing you may not be considering is uh, looking at other approaches and activities that connect you to your body. Um, given the language that you talked about, I feel like this is something that you may have already done, but there's a very popular and awesome book called The Body Keeps the Score, and it's all about trauma. Uh, it's a really great book. If you just search The Body Keeps the Score online, you will find it very quickly. It's kind of an industry standard book, um, both good for clinicians and for people that have experienced trauma. But um, if you haven't, definitely look into that. Um, in, in the book, um, it talks a little bit about things other than just therapy. And there are things other than therapy that can be helpful, things that connect you to your body. So everything from, you know, body work with a trained body worker. So that's somebody who's a professional that, you know, um, helps you to move and touches your body. It's kind of somewhere between therapy, physical therapy, massage, and dance at sometimes, you know, they, they have a variety of different approaches. Um, but that can be something that that's very helpful in these cases. Um, yourself, you know, doing dance, sports, anything that, as I said, connects you to your body can be very, very helpful. And what you want to do is you basically want to make your mind, your emotions, and your body communicate. And that can help you discover a lot and also actively process things. Um, if you don't do anything that helps you connect to your body, if you don't exert yourself at all, you might be surprised when you do at what comes out. Um, for an example, you know, personally, when I was going through a really difficult experience um, past year or so, I did a lot of personal work, you know, uh, things that I am used to doing, like journaling, meditating, whatever. But I was surprised by just how much emotion came out while I was exerting myself running. You know, when I hit sort of the peak of my heart rate at a run and a certain song was on, I just like burst into tears, you know, and that was a big part of processing what I was going through. So sometimes it's surprising the way this stuff comes out. Um, and lastly, there are some other approaches that a lot of people don't consider often for trauma including um, TMS, so transcranial magnetic stimulation. There's some research that looks at its impact on people who have uh, PTSD and traumatic reactions, as well as ketamine therapy. I've talked about this on the podcast before, but um, ketamine serves as a very active but uh, safer feeling way to process traumatic memories. 
because you are dissociated, but in a way that's um, more controlled. It's less scary usually. And the way that the chemical works is that it gives you the opportunity to really, really actively process this sort of information. So the walls come down, but the brain's ability to sort of adapt and work through things goes up. So um, check out the research for that. You know, ask your doctors if that's a possibility, if you're interested. Um, but there are other things there. Um, it's especially relevant if you've tried to do the work, you've given it a lot of time, and just nothing seems to be helping. So that's kind of what I have for you. Thank you for your question. I'm really proud of you for speaking up, for seeking help for this. Keep trying, you know, trust in the process, approach where you can rather than avoid. And if you're feeling stuck or unheard, something's not working, consider changing, consider other approaches. Um, there's no rush here though. You know, I know you want relief from these negative feelings, but remember that they can't harm you. Even if you have a full-blown flashback and it's just feeling so horrible, like it's happening to you all over again, you're still okay. You know, physically, you're still all right. It's very uncomfortable and it can stay with you for a while and it can be scary, but you're okay. So take things at your pace. Understand that this is worth your attention and you're not being dramatic. So thank you for the question. And with that, that is the end of this episode. This has been episode 291 of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. Um, as I said at the beginning, if you want to send me a question, shoot it to duffthepsych at gmail.com. If you want the show notes for this episode, go to duffthepsych.com slash episode 291 and take really good care of yourselves out there. Um, you know, make sure that you're handling your basics, even if this is a period of time that's very stressful for you, you know, make sure you're doing the stuff that you know you should be doing with your body and with your mind, just to take the basics of good care. Um, and I will see you for the next episode. All right. Bye.